Cruise 5 is here in Blanda Chirimba today and we're here to meet the owner of the house right behind me. The house is designed to look like a football. The owner of that house is Mr. Yan Yap Sonke. That is a five-story building that I am curious to see. But I know you're dying to know who Mr. Yan Yap Sonke is. Let's go ahead and meet him. This particular place we are in is a funny looking structure that you see when you're passing by on the Chirimba Road and it's a house that actually looks like a football and it's called Nyumba Yangati Mpila. <laughs> it's called Nyumba Yangati Mpila because it actually literally looks like a football and you know the man who stays here is Mr. Yan Yap Sonke, our guest today on Cruise 5. Welcome, Yan Yap Sonke. Thank you very much. You're what do I here. call you? Do I call you Yan? Do I call you Yap? Or do I call you Sonke? Most people call me JJ. JJ? Yeah. <laughs> I never knew they call you JJ. Yeah. I thought maybe they call you Sonke or something. Well, it's also possible. JJ. <laughs> okay, so. I we're... think in Malawi, the custom is to mainly stick to the surname. Isn't yes, it? exactly. But I don't mind. You yeah. don't mind. Fantastic. So, Mr. Sonke is. Um, he's a Malaw You are a Malawian now. Yes. But you're white. No, I'm not white. This is not white, it's, it's light brown. <laughs> white he's, <laughs> he's just being difficult. <laughs> he's just being difficult. Oh, yeah. He is Malawian, and I didn't know that you're an architect, as yes. a matter of fact. He's an architect. I'm a mechanical he, engineer and architect. A, mech a mechanical engineer and an architect. That's right. And you've been a politician uh, as well. No. People say that I'm a politician, but I'm not a politician. We'll hear more about that, but let's get to know more about our guest today, yes. Mr. Mr. Jan Yap Sonke. His Excellency Mulusi yes. dragged me in screaming, screaming and crying yes. and called me a politician, but I'm not. You're not a politician. <laughs> I mean, Even by denying that a politician, that makes you a politician, because you know what politicians do. No. They lie all the time. <laughs> well, I didn't. And I can tell you, promised I did not. Where were you born? I was born in a little town in Holland, Falkenswaard. Where is that? It's on the south of Holland, just near the Belgian border. I see. Mm. And you grew up there? No. Okay. Um, I lived there as a baby for one year, then my, my parents moved to another town, Flushing, near the sea. Okay. And when I was five years, uh, we moved to New Guinea. You New moved Gu quite a lot? Not that much. Yeah? Um, uh, well, I moved 20 three different houses but <laughs> uh, my, my father was a mission teacher then okay. he moved to Dutch New Guinea which is now part of Indonesia okay and that's where I basically grew up all right you can see my little things like stone eggs and my my poisoned arrows from New Guinea oh yeah that actually is, that was really stone age yeah we, we, we will have to take a tour at some point yeah. it, this this room is full of history yes and there's another room down here which is Full of even more history. <laughs> this place is full of stuff. Yeah. And just for those who are interested, we are in that house that looks like a football. And so, growing up, what was life like? What were you What were you doing? My father was a mission teacher. Okay. And uh, basically, where we stayed partly was Stone Age, complete Stone Age between men eaters. They were naked. Yeah. And that's where I grew up. It's only my brother and me. And it was my mother teaching us in primary school. So you, after, you grew around people who were walking around naked? Completely. What, what was that? You uh -huh. like, like, like what was a way of life or because of the age that you grew up in? They, they don't know clothes. They didn't know. That was really Stone Age. Actually, I've got a film here when they were cooking the chief. Yeah. He died and they ate him. They ate him? They ate him because they, they believed him. that if they ate him, his power would remain in the tribe. Oh, come on. You don't they necessarily need to. You, you, you Honestly. Don't. We don't have to eat somebody. I mean, just burn them or something. But no. I mean, eating them. We were actually offered a piece, but my father ah! refused. Did you, did, you, did you ever get to eat someone? No. <laughs> yeah? No, right. they, they seriously came. That's interesting. It was absolute unbelievable. But how did you come out <coughs> well, as a mechanical uh, the engineer? The thing is, I had to do primary school. My mother was teaching me, right. but there was no secondary school. Okay. So later on, when I was 
13 years I went to Holland okay. where I did a secondary school. Oh, yeah. I failed, but I went to technical school and then to higher technical school and then to mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. And then I went uh, as a volunteer to Kenya because that gave me exemption from military service. I didn't want to do military service. You didn't service. want to do military service? No. Why? That, that's, that's well, that's at that power. time uh, when I was you young, want to fight. There was the U USSR, you know, communist. Yes, yes. And everybody was scared that the USSR would one day conquer the rest of Europe. Uh -huh. And there was always that scare against USSR. Now, we had a strong army. But the thing is, so what is happening now in Ukraine is crazy. Yeah. I would be drafted in as, an, as a soldier. Yeah. And if Russia would attack us, I would have to shoot this young man, whom I don't know, who hasn't done anything wrong to me, yeah. who might have a family with children, and I have to shoot that man? Mm -hmm. For what? For what? If they want to take Holland, let them go. I will go somewhere if I'm not satisfied. There is Africa, you know. You have to, you have to defend your country. It's called... No, I didn't mother, feel like, like that. Like Russia, mother Russia. I, I don't feel like that. You didn't it, feel like that? No, for You're me, Holland... Convinced. Well, I have a link People very clearly. People have to defend their countries. To a certain their extent. If, 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 if I have to kill someone for it, no. I will go somewhere. Mm. That was my take. And the other thing is, it's in my religion too. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not kill. Jesus said it very clearly, and I believe in that. If someone hits you, turn the other cheek. What's your religion? You're a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian, yes, for sure. I'm a CCP Presbyterian. Okay. Mm. And you? But I'm very liberal. I can go to any church, to be honest. But, but you genuinely believed no killing. So you didn't, you didn't want to yeah. be trained how to kill. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I refused. And I went to Kenya as a volunteer. And uh, that was mechanical engineer only. Mm -hmm. I had to um, uh, build coffee factories and maintain the machinery and teach the people there and train them. But I felt so stupid there. I was learning more from the Kenyans than I learned. <laughs> so at the end I was very frustrated. I went yeah. back to Holland. I didn't have to do military service and decided to continue um, uh, how you call it, uh, studying. Mm -hmm. But because in Kenya I got involved in building coffee factories, I didn't know anything about it, but mm -hmm. they needed builders. Mm -hmm. So I got involved in that. I got interest and said, let me go to building. So I changed to architecture, ah. I got my master's degree in that. And then uh, on the 23rd of October, 75, mm -hmm. I uh, got my diploma. And on 11 November, I was at Chileka Airport. That's what I want to hear, <laughs> how this man landed in Malawi. But I heard a bell tolling earlier, and I think that's a reminder that we have to go to our first song. Do you love music? Yes. What kind of music do you like? Well, uh, anything, to be anything, honest. Anything, yeah. My preference is uh, classical. Yes. I try to play the violin, it's there. And, uh, but also, well, anything, to be honest. Good. I, well, what? not so much in, in pop and uh, heavy metal. That sort You're of more into the laid back kind of music. Yeah. Okay. What's our first song going to come from? Well, uh, things like Black Mambazo. Black the Mambazo. Music. <laughs> Let us with Black Mambazo. Yes, no problem. But they're not black. No, they are not black. They're brown, like every, all of us. <laughs> Let us with Brown Mambazo. <laughs> <laughs> we can't call them black because they're not black. But I've seen some really black people. Well, they are pretty dark sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and they're pretty white sometimes too. <laughs> but let's be honest. For me, there is only one thing. That's what? Muntu. Bas. Just Muntu. Bas. No, but some Muntus are black, some are brown, some are That's, pink. That makes it interesting. Some are white. That makes it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Let us meet Black Mambas, the first song on Cruise 5 today. Why, of all places, would you come to Malawi? You were in Kenya. You would have stayed in Kenya. Yeah. We, my father was to, in, in that uncontrolled area in New Guinea together with an Australian Baptist missionary. Okay. And uh, this Baptist missionary was our friends and we stayed in touch. Mm -hmm. He died, but his wife wrote a book. I've got it there. We are in it. Okay. Now, when my father was sent up country in New Guinea, the mission there had a general education secretary. Mm -hmm. And when we stayed at the coast of New Guinea, he was our neighbor. And we were very close, actually called him uncle. Okay. And uh, we were forced to hand over New Guinea to Indonesia in 63. Mm -hmm. So we all went back to Holland. My parents came back and he came back. And he became Africa secretary for the Dutch NGO, a church organization, ICCO. Mm -hmm. And that organization was financing a lot of projects in Malawi. Mm -hmm. 
Now, when I was still studying, Mr. Uh, van der Stoep, or Uncle Nees, mm -hmm. came to me and said, I need an architect in Malawi. Oh. So I said, Malawi? Where the heck is that? Exactly, exactly. You literally had to go to the map and say, Malawi? Well, I knew a little bit. I knew yeah. it was south of Kenya because <laughs> when I was in Kenya, south there was an agricultural Kenya. show and Kamuzu came there and I actually saw Kamuzu there. Okay. <laughs> and I said, this, this so place I knew it was Malawi. South yeah, south. like, whoa, so, somewhere down there. So I said, look, um, uh, I'm still studying, I can't go now. He said, look, there's nobody crazy enough to go to Malawi. Mm -hmm. I will wait for you. So there was so much pressure on it that when I did my final thesis in, in arch, uh, architecture, I didn't have to write to type it. I could submit it in handwriting. And that's why I said, 23 October I got my diploma and 11 November I was here. <laughs> quick, quick. They couldn't wait. They couldn't wait. But the reason why he said uh, we can't find anybody is that people are scared to go to Malawi. Mm -hmm. You know, at that time there was a bit of repression. Oh. And so many political prisoners in Malawi. The tension was building. There were 10,000 political prisoners at that time. And it was Mualo who started planning a coup, apparently, because he was hanged later on. You know that story. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, when Mualo was caught, that was in August 76, mm -hmm. things changed very much. Mm -hmm. It was Malusi who became secretary of the uh, Malawi yeah, Congress yeah. Party. Yeah. And a lot of people were liberated and released and relaxed. And it was much easier. But before that, very often any expatriate saying something wrong got 24 hours notice to go to yeah. the airport yeah. and back home. Yeah. So it was, it was tense in that time. Yes. In, in fact, what happened is uh, I came on the 11th of November and on the 3rd December, Christian Service Committee was closed by government for alleged subversive activities. Wow. And I was sitting like this for three months. Wow. Got a telegram from Holland to come back. But the same day, the Christian Service Committee was allowed to work again. And you're so like, I, oh, I was, I was going to leave, but now I'm going to stay. I stayed. Wow. That was and, and that's it? That's it. You stayed in Malawi? I stayed. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, Kamuzu was somehow favoring expatriates. Mm -hmm. So as long as you play the game, you keep your mouth shut. Yes. And you could do really what you want. It was quite free for us. You because could. the Malawians were repressed, not us. Yeah. But uh, of course, slowly, slowly, things started tightening up. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, Christian Service Committee, after four years, I moved to Malawi Housing Corporation mm -hmm. and worked there for seven years. And then I started my own business. Yes. And then, uh, well, the story came in 92 uh, that I got involved in politics <laughs> by coincidence. <laughs> what, hap what happened is that... Uh, yes. Can I say? <laughs> please, please. That's, what, that's, that's what I'm dying to hear, how you ended up well, I actually, was, yes, I was the first one doing solar panels in Malawi, okay. electrical and uh, water heaters. I made many water heaters and I had to install a solar pump for Dennis and Kwasi. So I went there to assess the, the situation, to see where the pump should be, etc. And after that, I went to Rumpi to visit Kwasi and we chatting there on the Konda and he started ah, about politics. We want multi-party politics, we want democracy in this country, we're going to chase this guy, we don't want John Tembo and things like that. Yeah. So he said, Eesh, are you not scared? He yeah. said, no, no, they don't dare to tackle me. Who was that? Dennis Kwasi. Okay. He, he was one of the top afford people. Yes. So he said, yeah, I realize we need change. I mean, Camus is not going to live forever. Yeah. So if you need some support, maybe I can help you. And that's how I ended up in politics. But, but, no, 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 no. This doesn't make sense to me. Something must have been welling up in you that erupted at this time. Was it just an, an impromptu was, decision that you made? It was an impulse. Just I like said, that? Look, I, uh, there was a dictatorship. Yes. And he talks about democracy and I said, it makes sense. Let's get some freedom. So why can't I do some help? I offered him and said, look, maybe I can get some finance from Europe, etc. Yes. Right, I was scared, nothing happened. But uh, a year later, when uh, they talked about the referendum that, that was allowed, they came back to me and said, you said uh, you can help us with some money maybe, get us from abroad or here. So I said, well, I'll try. And I got uh, quite a lot of money from Europe, approaching many donors. Mm -hmm. And that actually financed our Ford. So I got in, in, into a Ford and uh, they put me in the executive committee. <laughs> but what happened later on is when Chihana was released, yes. uh, he, we had still some money left over after the referendum. He blew it in no time. Mm -hmm. And he came to me and said, can you get us some more money? 
So I said, yes, but I have to account for the money which we got. Yes, first. And he said, okay. And he called his treasurer. There was nothing. The money was just gone. There was no records, no paper, no bank statement, nothing. Jesus Christ. So, and at the same time, UDF came up. And uh, I said, no, no, no. We want to de defeat one party, MCP. We must unite UDF and afford. No, no, Chihana said, you're negative. I'm going to win this election hands down. I said, why not? 15% for you, not more, because I knew a fort was Norse, right? Yeah, yeah. He said, no, yes, negative, you're demoralizing us. At the same time, I had to get more money, but there was no accounts, and they couldn't account for it. Mm. So I said to myself, I'm not a politician, mm -hmm. I quit. And I wrote an article in the newspaper, Confessions of this Negative oh. Soul, <laughs> in the nation. I knew you know. <laughs> so what happened is, Molusi phoned me, uh -huh. come here. Yes. So I went to Limburg and he bear hugs me. Thank ah, you very much. Ah, thank you so much for that article. Yes, this is what we wanted. So that's how I ended up in your life. <laughs> I guess anybody who, who dared to embrace you that time would have won your heart. <laughs> well, I didn't do anything really. Okay. Uh, Malusi put me in the task force organizing things. Yeah. But that was the end after the election. Yes. But comes, uh, uh, well, what happened is before the, the elections and the, uh, the um, referendum, I invited some chiefs to my house. Mm -hmm. You know, this was a squatter area here, mm -hmm. and there was no development. Yeah. Camus was always talking about, we are going to raise all these houses and build some nice houses. Nice houses yes. But they never did anything. Yeah. And there were no services, there was no water, there was nothing. Yeah. They just neglected it. So I invited Chief Musa Magas mm -hmm. and a few others. And I said, why don't we set up a development committee mm -hmm. and we do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. I can get you some money. But they were scared. Yeah. But after the referendum, they came back to me and they said, Mr. Sonke, you said you we You said do something some time yeah. back. And we are ready now. Uh -huh. we wanted, so we did that. We set up Kabul a Development Association mm -hmm. and we did a lot of work. I built 65 water kiosks, wow. bridges. We mm -hmm. built a health center and things like that. Now, in 94, Kubalo was elected MP here yeah. and became Minister of Defense. Yes. But in, uh, in 88, 98, when the election started coming up, mm -hmm. they started campaigning and they came to me and said, Mr. Sonke, Kabwal is doing nothing. We, we want, want you. you. Oh. And I said, no, 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 I'm not a politician. Oh. I don't speak Chichewa. Oh, look at the man who says he's not a politician. He's not going to run for MP. But then Wolusi sent a delegation and said, look, we want you. And <laughs> it always starts like that. And Wolusi campaigned here for me. Yes. And I told him, if I get 75% of the votes, I'll do it. <laughs> he said, yeah, he makes sure. And he did. He came here campaigning for me. Yeah, the 75%. <laughs> so I was elected in Parliament, and two days later, he makes me Deputy Minister of Finance. <laughs> <laughs> That's our guest today on Cruise 5, Mr. Yeah. Jan Yap Sonke. Yeah. We're talking from his house here in Chirimba, Blanta. Second song. First, we did uh, Let Us Smith Black in quotes Mambazo. What are we going to do this time around? Well, uh, you had the CD for uh, Soweto, Soweto String Quartet. Yeah. You also like Soweto I String Quartet. That, yeah. Soweto yeah, String Quartet, event. beautiful music Try from it. South Africa. Let's take a break. This is Cruise 5, and today we're talking to Mr. Jan Yap Sonke, who has been a member of parliament for Blanta Kabula, Blanta Kabula constituency, mm -hmm. without uttering a single word in Chichewa. Well, I could say, still say Muribanji. <laughs> <laughs> you got a political run and say Muribanji, and you got you Look, got the votes. Kamus had Jays at you, so I found my translator. <laughs> <of what. laughs> did you ever have to do some political rallies and address people and stuff plenty, like that? Plenty, plenty, plenty. You did that? Oh yes, <laughs> lots of them. <laughs> yeah, I know. Without rallies, you can't win an election. There's no way. I just find it fascinating how a person who can't speak a word in Chichewa goes around campaigning and they actually win a whole constituency. With 74%. With 74%. Quite a landslide, actually. <laughs> quite a landslide. And then you became minister. Yes. Um, twice, is it? Uh, you, no, you, were, you, were, you were deputy minister of finance. Finance. And then later on was moved as deputy minister to transport and works. Uh, yeah, public works. Yeah. yeah so... Uh, at that time, was there another Mzungu in the cabinet, or you were the only no, one? No. The only Mzungu in cabinet uh, ever has been uh, Cameroon. Yes. In the, in the beginning, mm -hmm. first cabinet. Yeah. Mm. 
What, what was it like? Tell me about your experience working as a cabinet minister now. Well, <laughs> what can I say? I'm not a financial man. Yes, and they, yet but, they made you deputy finance minister. Well, I think very much that uh, Mulusi had in mind the confidence for donors. Yeah. Ah. And they put me in charge on uh, debt and aid uh, coordination and things like that. Yes. Uh, you know, they expect Mzungu to be honest. Yes. Which is wrong assumption <laughs> because they are very crooked Mzungus too. So. <laughs> but anyway, I, I guess that, that he had that in his back of his mind. Yes. But I'm not a financial man. Yes. But you see, in politics, ministers are not appointed on skills. Uh, you get, uh, instead of it works, you get an engineer. No, you get an administrator instead of an engineer. Mm -hmm. I think it's always wrong, but that is the general practice, even in Europe. I mean, yeah. it's not only here. Yeah. And especially in Malawi, I feel that ministers should be professional in their... That's what I... That's what because I, I think we can't afford all that. We that, need that, guys who really know you that. You see, people say, oh no, you're just the political head of the ministry. I say, yeah. that's fine, but still, you need to know something about what you're... What, that's what, what, you're... what I always feel, but that's not how it is done. And so, how can a minister of works judge if he has been told the right things by his... They wouldn't know. The PS, they can it's tell him anything know. and he can't judge it. It beats me how you move somebody from the health ministry to the finance ministry yeah. and then from finance to agriculture and then from agriculture to defense. You can't be a jack of all trades, yeah. especially when you're a minister. You can't possibly know things sophisticated enough to head all those ministries. Well, I can tell you, you know, a good friend of mine, Kenny Penga, was yeah. made minister of finance. And they cheated him. It was that time when they were bore, the MRA was borrowing money to boost their income. Yeah. And he didn't see that because he was not a financial man. Absolutely. And uh, some of financial would probably have noticed and say, hey, there's something funny here. Yeah. And uh, I think public works would have suited you better. Oh, yes. Because yeah, because you are an engineer and an architect. Works or uh, yeah. energy and things like that. That's, yes. that's my skill. You now see, for example, uh, um, people coming, oh, this road is substandard, etc., and they blame the contractor. Yeah. Was it the contractor? I thought it was the contractor. No. Who was it? What about the client? He gives the specifications. What about the engineer designing it? What about the lack of money to build a quality road? You see, our engineers know how to make a quality road. They do. But they can't do it because the money is not there. Mm. You see, that road down there is not yeah. a tarmac road. It is a tarmac road. No, it's a dirt road, but they smear a little bit of tarmac on it, only this thick. That's why you get potholes. That's a tarmac road. Now, why engineers know that that is like that, but they get the blame for getting potholes. Uh -huh. And that's not how it works. Uh -huh. So, if you are a layman and you are the minister of works as a minister, you can't judge that. Yeah. Even the VP started complaining about those things, but he is also not an engineer. And who is explaining it to him? Nobody dares to do that. Yeah. So those are the issues I have. And also in finance, I didn't see all the things. I learned a heck of a lot from uh, Chico Onda. Mm -hmm. He really taught me a lot, to be honest. He had a he, finance brain. Yeah, and he also involved me very much in it. Uh -huh. He gave me tasks to yes. do. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was extremely interesting. Uh, paid a high price for it at the end. I lost my business, <laughs> but uh, I don't regret it. <laughs> Because you set up your business later on. No, I lost my business mm -hmm. because uh, I fell out with Malusi because of several issues. Yes. Uh, uh, we reconciled very nicely. I mean, I respect Malusi a lot, eh, to be honest. Many mm. people don't, but I do. And uh, uh, so I came out as more or less, yeah, I, I lost my business because of this. I had to start again. But because of the churches, I got some architectural work and building work and I started building again. Yeah. And then an architect, uh, a Sri Lanka architect who was yeah. running Clinton Evans, uh -huh. retired and went to America uh -huh. and he gave Clinton Evans to me okay. to run. And that's how I survived up to now. Let's go back architect. a bit uh, and look at your involvement in politics at that time and how you were among the people who resisted uh, Bakir Mulhouse's attempt to get a third term mm. and you paid the ultimate price because I think you were kicked out of the party or something. Tell yes. us the events surrounding that. What exactly happened around that time? When uh, my first minister was uh, Chilumpa uh -huh. and only for half a year and then uh, Mulhouse appointed Chico Onda. Yes. 
Nou, Chico Ono was a brilliant guy. Mm -hmm. He knew exactly. He had his 10-point plan, etc. Yes. And uh, uh, I really was happy that he, he did. Mm -hmm. I went to Malusi. Mm -hmm. And I, I told Malusi Bana, if you stick to the policies of this man, you may wish to go a third term. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, uh, Chico Ono was very strict on control of finances. Mm -hmm. This is what we have, this is what we spend, no more. Right? And, that that made it difficult to do certain projects, uh -huh. and I think all the politicians, the ministers, uh, had difficulties with that. He was strict. If they overspent, that's the end of the story. Wow! And they hated that. Yes. And uh, I think Mulusi could also not stomach it. Yes. And he fired him at the end, and because that was one of the reasons why I said, "Look, we have to change." And at the same time, there were other issues. Uh, the mood changed against him. The donors were not happy, very unhappy. The churches were not happy. And then I went to him and said, Wana, I, I wrote a memo to him. Maybe it is uh, time to, to select someone else. And he was very furious about that. That is when I went against the third term. And uh, he groomed uh, Bingo and he made him president. Mm. And you were quite open about not wanting him to stand for the third time. Well, I didn't see the country progressing, so it didn't go well. <laughs> That's the yes, problem. yes. Were you physically manhandled at some point? No, were you hunted no. down? Because uh, no, in no. those days, people who spoke against the third term were facing quite some uh, consequences. Well, Malusi was extremely angry. That, that is true when he saw me as a traitor, I think. But Later on, we reconciled, and I think we, we, we talk again quite nicely. Okay. I think he also regretted making Bingo president, because Bingo turned against him. He expected that he would be okay, but that was not happening. I don't think he saw that coming yeah. in any way. Look, at one stage, I can tell you, Bakili asked me, do you think I can make Ali Kabanda or Malawesi president? Mm -hmm. And I told him, Excellency, you can make anybody president. Yes. It was the way Muruzi campaigns. It's yes. fantastic. Yes. It's very, very aggressive and oh. very charismatic. Charismatic. Yes. He, he really knows that. Yeah. Bingo lost the elections before that with only 1% of the votes. Yes. And Muruzi makes him president. Exactly. That is his skill. Yeah. The man is fantastic on yeah. that. Yes. <laughs> but the problem is, uh, yeah, the financial side. You know, we have no money in this country. I mean, a lot of money comes from the donors. Half of the budget is donor finance. Absolutely. So you have to appease the donors to be able to get that. And, you know, our economy needs to change. Everybody says Malawi is an agricultural country. Mm -hmm. So we have to stimulate agriculture. Yes. The problem is this world is not waiting for more tobacco or tea or coffee or sugar. That's all restricted. If we make more, the price will only go down. We need to start making something. We need to industrialize. And it starts with added value to, to agriculture. Yes. But, but there is some possibilities and horticulture and things like that, but that's not going to make Malawi wealthy. We need to make something. And that has always been my argument, but they don't do that. They keep on focusing on agriculture only. Raw materials. They, they don't get you anywhere. They're no. the cheapest stuff that you can Look, sell. A packet of cigarettes, yes. right now I don't know, but in that time, uh, in, in Europe, has something like 15 dollar cents tobacco in there, mm. which they sell in Holland for 6 euros. And there's 15 dollar cents tobacco yes. in there. Yeah. So yeah. where is the added value? Not in that tobacco. No. And to be honest, I wrote once an article in the Dutch newspaper and said, this is theft. Because Nobody in Holland is allowed to grow what we grow here mm -hmm. with the labor price of 50 kwacha yeah. per month. Mm -hmm. There is a minimum salary, which is uh, how much? Uh, 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. Now, if we would grow the tobacco and pay our laborers 1.5 million, that price will go up. Yes. But they're not ready to pay that. Exactly. But then they're actually the smoking tobacco or drinking tea made by slave labor. Yeah. Because maybe the slaves were better off in the old days than the people now. Because what do they get in the tea estates for plucking tea? It's nothing. Nothing. It's actually sickening. Yeah. How do we change that? How do we change it? You know, Malawi has developed enormously. That's what Kamuzu used to say. It's true. Uh, I calculated that 
the buying power of Malawi products since independence is maybe four and a half times bigger. Mm -hmm. That's good growth. Mm -hmm. When I came to Malawi, Malawis didn't have cars. Now look at it. Yeah. But the population is six times bigger. Mm -hmm. So per capita, it's actually worse. Exactly. And we have a very good big group of Malawis who have income. Mm -hmm. We were one of them. Mm -hmm. But out there, they are poor, mm -hmm. dirt poor. What are we going to do? You know, when I went to Kenya, uh, it was just after independence in Kenya, we yes. were volunteers, we were going to help these guys, and in 10 years' time, they're going to be on, the, on their own feet. So that didn't happen. I wrote an article in the newspaper, said now we have given 50 years development aid, that is some 20 years ago that I did that. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do the next 20 year, 50 years to really make Africa independent? Exactly. And I made suggestions there, and I wrote in that article, we have uh, not achieved what we wanted to achieve. To be honest, the Dutch Minister of Development Aid saw that article and wrote to me. He said, you said that development aid has failed. I don't agree with that. I wrote back to him and said, no, it didn't fail. Without development aid, there wouldn't have been single hospital built in of Malawi. Of course, right? yes, yes. So that worked. Yeah. But they're still not independent. Exactly. We haven't achieved what we want to achieve. That's slightly different. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's failed. Mm. We tried. And what are we going to do? And we're still in that situation. We're still in that situation because we are developing. It's true. But the population is growing faster than we develop. And nobody <sighs> seems to agree and accept that. That is my big problem. And this is where I, I, I tend to think that sometimes sovereignty is overrated because everybody says, oh, we're a sovereign country. No, you are we're not. an independent country. We're not independent. You're not independent if half your budget is funded by donors. Exactly. And these donors send people there with big salaries to control that money because if they don't do it, mm -hmm. what is going to happen? The, independ the real independence will come. Yeah, but that money will be squandered. They they see that, yes, yes. Right? I've seen that so much uh, money being squandered. Whew. It's still there. Down the drain. Look, I talked to uh, His Excellency Chakwera. Yeah. And we talked about corruption. Okay. And he said that, that he was very determined, and he is, to, to stop that. But I asked him, Bana, how? Mm -hmm. Because one, the country is sick like this, because we are sick right now. Mm -hmm. How do you change that? That's a challenge. It is very, very difficult. You must miss politics. You oh. must go back to politics. <laughs> you, <laughs> no, quit. Like... you quit politics because they kicked you out no, of the I, cabinet. I, I, because they didn't, I, you, I you went quit. to three elections to try. <laughs> <laughs> you quit politics. Did you actually have to quit politics? Look, uh, Lemani, you know, when uh, you remember there was this case uh, that uh, the UDF wanted to fire three judges. Mm -hmm. And I warned uh, Boulouzi, but also the fellow politicians in the UDF that you can't. If you try to fire judges, all the donors will shut up mm -hmm. because there is the independence of the judiciary. That's true. And Europe is very scared of that. Yes. They learned that in World War II. Mm -hmm. Don't tamper with the judiciary. Don't. So I said, please, don't do it. But they did. Oh. And I refused to sign the petition asking Molusi to fire these people. Yes. And Lemani came to me and said, look, if that's the case, I will make sure you never become an MP anymore. So I never managed to win the elections. I did three elections, but I never managed. Yes. To get anywhere. Yeah. Because, I mean, after a while, we see you going back and trying to reclaim your seat. And uh, that, that never worked. It never worked. No. That never worked. But and he uh, never got back into government after that? No, I mean, I've got many friends there, I can talk and uh, do that, but <laughs> not in politics anymore. I'm now 77, and if I would only suggest to my wife that I would go back, hey, <laughs> she would jump up and down. <laughs> the bell tolled again, and that tells us it's time to take a quick break. Um, talking to Jan Yaps, okay. What's that bell that keeps tolling? Is that a, is that a doorbell or it's a it's a bell that tells the time? Uh, this one. Yes. That's a clock. That's a clock. Yeah, I inherited that from an uncle. <laughs> from all the way from back home. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I've got another one upstairs which I uh, inherited from my great grandfather. Wow. It's more than 120 years old. <laughs> yes, 120 years old. It must yeah, be in those days, that was the only way of having a Yes, course. absolutely, absolutely. We're going to take a break. Uh, we listened to Ladysmith Black Mambazo. We've listened to Soweto String Quartet. 
What are you going to listen to next? Do another Mambazo. Do another <laughs> Ladies with Black Mambazo. Of course, who would complain? We could play all the Ladies with Black Mambazo we want and nobody would get bored. This is Cruise 5 coming your way live from Mr. Yan Yap Sonke's house in Chirimba, Blantyre. Get back to issues of development and politics later. But um, let, let's, let, let's look at the other side of you. Uh, which I, I recall not many people know, and that is the, the architecture that you do and uh, the designing that you do. You designed the Blanta uh, um, Multipurpose Hall, the, uh, the, the Blanta Synod Multipurpose Hall. Well, my biggest project was the regional office. The regional, the Blanta government office's yes. regional office. That was my, my biggest project. Yes. And then the Multipurpose Hall and the, uh, the, uh, the Catholic Church in uh, Tinyonga. Yes. Another one. But the rest, I, I probably built maybe some 200 schools. Mm -hmm. Some I built, some I, I only supervised construction and design as an architect. In fact, when I, my four years in Christian Service Committee, I did a lot. I was in charge of the building department, so I was designing and building. Mm -hmm. And we built maybe some 30 health centers in that time, because at that time, there were no contractors going to uh, the field. We were building health centers for government mm -hmm. because Christian Service Company had a big building department. Okay. We had 480 people. Wow. And uh, that later all changed. But at that time, we built a lot. And actually, this house is quite a work of wonder. When, when you're passing by outside, it, it doesn't look like it's a, it's a proper habitable house. But when you get in here, you see that it's being put to proper use, and it's actually a work of genius. Um, what inspired you to come up with this concept? Because it looks like a football outside. Well, it's another story. It started in my my training in architectural school. Okay. We had, a, you know, in architectural training, they look at architects as the artists. Okay. They make something beautiful. Yes. And the engineers work out the details. Exactly. But when I was studying, I, I had already worked, so I knew what you know, what in practice you, you need to know. And I was arguing as an architect, I have to supervise those engineers mm -hmm. because I am in charge. Yes. So I need to know how they do it. Exactly. So one of the professors said, yeah, I agree with you. And let's set up a team of 12 students for traditional building. Okay. And you are going to design a house from the traditional, from the foundation to the top, oh. every detail. Yes. And that's what we did. Okay. And after you finished, he said, now you design something completely out of this world, out of the world. Now, this man designed his own house, but it was a cubicle on his tip. Wow. And he built it. There are, uh, he called it a forest. It's in Rotterdam. Wow. But I was inspired by that. Yes. I said, I will make a ball. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. Quite now, a spacious house in here. So uh, what happened is I divorced here and I've got a house in Michiro. Yes. So I needed a new house. Okay. And through the party, I got this plot. Yes. And but it was close to the road and had these beautiful trees that I didn't want to cut down. Yes. So I said, let me go up. Yeah. So I can look over the trees and have the view. <laughs> <laughs> so it's narrow at the at the bottom, but it's quite big yeah. up here. And, and it's high up, so we have a nice view. You can see a yeah. nice view from a bird's eye view from yeah. up here. Yeah, but people have always complained that um, the architecture in Malawi isn't that awe inspiring. I mean. Apart from maybe the Reserve Bank uh, headquarters in Lilongwe and I think the St. Michael's and All Angels Church and, 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 and this and, and a few others, you don't really get to see these awe-inspiring um, buildings. What, what is it? Is it lack of creativity or what is it exactly? Okay, go to Britain. Yes. There are maybe five, six, ten thousand architects there. Mm -hmm. How many landmarks do you see there? that you say, oh, this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's just a handful. Yeah. So out of these 10,000 architects, there are only very few who make something completely new and special. Mm -hmm. And to be original and new, it's not easy because everything has been tried in this world. Yeah, you can't reinvent the wheel, as they say. That, that's right. I mean, these houses may be something like that, and yeah. multi-purpose hall, because yeah. that hasn't been done before. Yeah. But it is not easy, especially if you go to office buildings, to do something that is different from all the other office okay. buildings. All right. So what I see, some of my colleagues, I don't, I don't blame them. I think it's okay. But uh, the other thing is, look at the Reserve Bank here and the National Bank. Mm -hmm. The billions they spend there, billions. Billions. That is your and our money. Mm -hmm. And everything in that National Bank and Reserve Bank is important. Mm -hmm. 
the only thing that's in there from Malawi is sand and stone. Yes. That's all. Yeah. That's maybe only three or four percent of the whole building. Of the rest course. comes from South Africa. Yeah. Can we afford that? What do, what do we really we need? What do we want? Can we not be a bit more down to earth and say this is what we need? Nobody needs that national bank the way it is, and you and me are paying for it. Look at the profit they make. So that's a utility building to me. It doesn't need to be fancy. Mm. If a private business wants to make something fancy, I have no problem. Mm. That is their problem. But if it is the utility buildings, I have a problem. Right now, uh, yeah, I've just seen the specifications which they want for the new Ejenko office, which they want to do here. It's extravagant. extravagant. They don't need it. Mm -hmm. You know, in that specification, the smallest office is 20 square meter. And I'm, I'm really interested to, to put, it in the pub, put it in the public. The Minister of Works has got a list of standard sizes for offices. Mm -hmm. The smallest one is 10 square meter and 12 square meter. Why would the secretary in the Janko building have an office of 20 square meter, which is as big as the living room of a, a D3 standard house? <laughs> that is extravagant. We don't need that. Mm. But people go for that because they want to show that Malawi is not poor, but Malawi is poor. I've always been told that it's not poor. Yeah, yeah. It is not poor in principle. Mm. The people are poor down there. Sorry for that. Yeah. And we have no money to build the schools ourselves. And we have no money to build the hospitals ourselves. But we've got the money to build... A Jenko building. Lavish. We can't there. even provide the electricity we need. They should just be in a bloody shed, to be honest. They don't need that. They're a service provider. But why are they doing that? And why is that being stimulated? That is where I feel bad. But that aside, I mean, you walk, you walk around town and you see some really substandard buildings and you're like, oh my gosh, what is this? Is this a shack or what? No, okay. But you look, if a Jenko needs an, an, a new office, the old ESCOM uh, building is okay. They just need to refurbish it. That sort of office, okay, I have no problem with it, but not this extra extravagance. You can, build, you can build a nice office block, a simple one, with less, uh, less important material and things like that, more down to earth. Now, you touched on an issue about the quality of the works that we were putting up, and you were saying, who should the fingers point at? Should it be the contractor or the client? I mean, wh what's your take on that? Because people have been talking about the, um, the harsh auditor who comes around every year, and that's the rains, and it cuts roads like nobody's business. It pulls down bridges that were substandard, and structures are collapsing all around. And people are saying, we paid a lot of money to have these things built, mm -hmm. and here we are, roads washed away. And then you look at the, the, the size of the tarmac that was put in there. Money. Mm-hmm. Look, at, engineers know what to do to get, make a quality road. If you go to Europe, yes. in Holland, the tarmac is this thick, mm -hmm. not less than that. Here it is just a seal, a single seal, they call it a single seal. A single that's seal. A, that's nothing. And that's money. But engineers know it. Like these roads which have been broken through, uh, you know, uh, by, by rivers. Mm -hmm. In Europe, that river would have been channelized with trees. There's no erosion there mm -hmm. because everything is controlled. Yes. There is no dry soil or anything. It's mm -hmm. all controlled so you don't get silt washing in. Mm -hmm. But here, the moment it rains, all these rivers feeding into the Syria River carry lots of soil mm -hmm. and they dump it into the pond there at the, uh, at, at the power station mm -hmm. and block everything. Yes. And there is absolutely no control. Engineers know how to solve that problem. But if you have a few trillion questions ready, then they will do it. Yeah. It's not so easy. And we don't have that. So we are failing to control these tributary rivers. We can't channelize them. There are no trees along the banks to prevent erosion. It's not there. And in the dry season, it's all dust. So the first rain comes, mm -hmm. all that dust goes into the river mm -hmm. and blocks everything. And nothing stops that water to flow that quickly because there's no vegetation to absorb it. And everybody knows that. Engineers know that. But we get a specification from government, make this tarmac road, and that has a single seal. So they do that. What else can they do? 
Aha. So now you answered my question ahead before I before I even asked because you you're privileged to have been at different levels of government. I mean, mm -hmm. you've been an engineer, a, 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 an architect, and uh, a, a, a member of parliament and a minister. So you should possibly know the the chain and where the where the problem is, the weakest link. Mm -hmm. So as you're putting it, it is the government's responsibility. It is, of course. But look, I was in cabinet meeting and I was uh, helping making the budget, right? With yes. Chico Onder, for example. Yes. And we make a budget, proposals, and we go to cabinet, propose it, and Chico Onder said, look, you want so much for agriculture, so much for health, and so much for education. Yes. The money is finished. Mm -hmm. What about the other ministries? So they start cutting. Mm -hmm. And another problem I've seen very strongly, that's why many projects stall, uh, and that's very often political. The president wants this, 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 this project. So in the Minister of Works, they say, oh, we get money for this and this, this project. It's not enough. So they cut the budget for every project, and no project is fully funded. Instead of selecting the few projects they can do, and do them they well. spread that money on a lot of projects, and nothing is properly funded, and everything stalls. And that's political pressure on the technicians to spread the budget and they don't argue that's what i've seen very often yeah but, um, that, that's a big problem but the basic thing is look uh, when i was a minister the government the budget of my university in holland was exactly the same as the budget of malawi the budget of the university yes in holland was the same as our budget in malawi so like you don't talk anymore that's poverty <laughs> and whatever comes in for these roads is financed by a donor, not by us. Mm. Well, right now with the fuel levy, we do some roads too. Yeah. Yeah. That is our problem. And we need to start making things and exporting it to be able to finance our own projects. And we're failing to do that. Well, that's a song that we've been singing for quite some time now. Yeah. Value addition. Mm -hmm. manufacturing mm -hmm. and things like that and exporting being a predominantly exporting country and not an importing one doesn't look like we're going to start doing that anytime soon no i don't see it happening you see i think one of the biggest problems we have is that we brought south africa into the sadak because it's a rich country we should have built a big wall between south africa and the rest of us you know why how I've been manager for Sacramento Limited here for two years. Okay. And we make hospital beds. All right. Among other things. We make them about one and a half times more expensive than South Africa. Uh -huh. Why? I get an order for five hospital beds. Okay. And I make five hospital beds. And uh -huh. it takes me months. In South Africa, that factory makes these five hospital beds in one hour. In no time. And that's mass production. And they chalk and everybody they are out sitting of on the steel which they buy from the steel factory at 20% discount. We buy it at retail prices. Mm. So there's no way we can compete with South Africa. Mm. South Africa has got 70% of the GDP for all South African countries together. We can't compete with that engine. That is so powerful. And I don't see how we break out of that. I had a meeting with Trevor Manuel, the Minister of Finance in Lesotho, and we sat down the whole night discussing this. Donors say South Africa is the engine of growth for the Sadak region. To me, it's the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. And I challenged him. And it was very interesting. I was at a conference in Durban when uh, someone in the conference challenged Tabo Mbeki. The same thing. He said, the donors say, you're going to be the engine of growth for us. What are you going to do? He didn't know what to say. It's Cisano who answered the question. I thought having such a superpower in the region helps us, you know, uh, push every every Look, every commodity that side. The moment we start exporting textile to them, they start striking there. We don't want that stuff. You have seen that, because we can make it cheaper, but they they protest against. It. Don't forget that I think the development aid money we get for a large part is spent in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I think it's creating something like three hundred thousand jobs in that country mm -hmm. instead of doing it here. Now. For example, what's happening at the moment is primary schools. I've discussed it, and I argued against it. The thing is that I built a lot of primary schools funded by DFID and UNICEF. And before the, the, the referendum, before the change, there were no Malawian contractors. 
And one of the policy changes is we must empower Malawians to do the, the building. And a lot of contractors were registered. But contractors who had no skills, they were not trained. So a lot of crap was starting in, a lot of subtender buildings. And uh, so much things happened also in government that the donors got disgusted with us. Now they're starting building prefab steel structures. And they're just filling in the wall with, with bricks, that's all. But the prefab steel structure means that those from South Africa. Yes. Instead of building it locally. Uh -huh. And yeah, the donors just got fed up with this. I argued, they said, you should help our contractors to become skilled yes. properly. So instead of running away from yeah, it. Yeah. But that's what's happening. Now we can, I see steel structures coming up. Come on. That's a very negative approach. What will it take for a country like Malawi to come out of the doldrums and start rising as an economic power, even just in the region? I think it needs a daring approach from government. I wrote a memo to Malusi, Malawi, etc. And I said, wanna cut the taxes for any company that's productive, that makes something. Okay. Cut the tax for any company that exports to 50%. Okay. Raise the taxes on any company who does only trading. You see, if you do trading, you buy stuff in South Africa, you sell it here, you make a quick buck. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. But that's not developing Malawi. Push up the tax for that company. Yeah. Reduce any company that's producing. Yes. Make a contract with companies. Say, if you produce, 50, uh, export 50% of your products, we are going to cut your taxes even more. Mm -hmm. Give them an incentive. But do it in such a way that it is long-term guarantee. Make a contract, okay. a binding contract with these companies. Go around in Malawi and say, which company could make this? Which, which can, what can you do? Can you do this? Okay. How, how, how can you do more? Yes, but I need this and this. Preference at the MRA. No nonsense with import uh, delays, etc. Do everything possible to make it interesting for these companies to invest in production. You see, if you invest in... Uh, trading, buying from South Africa and selling here, that's a quick buck, mm -hmm. quick turnover. Mm -hmm. If you want to invest in manufacturing, that takes time. Yes, and you lots of build, money. You have to invest in machinery and you have to create a market and all the sort of stuff. So they, these companies must be stimulated and you must put nothing in their way. Open it up. But that needs guts to do it. It needs guts. And that's what beats me because you think a politician's main aim, I do believe, is to be voted back into power. Yeah. And if you boost the economy, people are going to be happy. People are going to have some money to spend. And, and then that guarantees yeah. you another term. Yeah. But it doesn't look like that math really works in politics, does it? No. I mean, they don't seem to realize that if they make sure that the economy ticks, they are guaranteed the next term. Mm -hmm. Because the people will see, as long as they see that there's progress, they will vote for that guy. But, but they don't see it, so it changes. Maybe the issue is that it's the, your approach might have to take maybe uh, 10 to 15 years before people start seeing the results and they don't have that luxury of time. Maybe it's just five years they have to impress so they go for the low-hanging fruits. Yeah. And we're back to square zero. And the other problem is, you see, a man like Molusi can speak so well. He could have argued when he was campaigning, gentlemen, ladies, two kids or three kids, which you educate well, not ten, please. Mm -hmm. He could have convinced the people. Yes. Look, the educated people in town are having less children because okay. they want their children to be educated. Properly. That's true. But out there, they are breathing like rats. If one quarter of your uh, people is sitting in a primary school, you can't handle that. Even a rich country can't handle that. Mm. We don't educate because of that. We need to reduce the population growth. Many people disagree, but I'm convinced that it's a problem. We can't outstrip our economic grow, grow on the population growth percentage. We need to outstrip that. Now, you know Bayani Primary School? Mm -hmm. You know how many children there are? No, I don't. You, you guess. I'm scared to guess. <laughs> well, the last time I checked, it was something like 11,000. Oh, my gosh. That means 300 children in one classroom block, but they're sitting outside, of course, yeah. running in ships. What sort of education can these teachers give? They are, these, these guys, they are good, eh? they try, but this is not something you can handle. No, you can't. It's overwhelming. Yeah, it's crazy.
I feel like taking a break. What do you think? I, I think we could do with some music now. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> We're going to take a break. I can do with a drink too. <laughs> <laughs> could do with a drink. We're going to have some, some drinks on the break. Uh, uh, Today, this is Cruise 5. We're talking to Jan Yap Sonki. He's a Malawian architect and um, engineer and uh, former politician, although he denies it. <laughs> former cabinet minister, and many, uh, many things rolled into one. Well, when did you become a proper Malawian? Like a proper, you, you, you had to get Malawian nationality at some point. In 1994. Well, I, I, I applied for it because the simple thing is that I had decided to stay in this country and die here. Yes. And I didn't want to be a stranger in this country. So you said, let me just become a Malawian. About it. In 1994, became a proper Malawian. Mundiji Pasojang Ziga, that national ID. Do you, you have it? And the passport. And it says Malawian. And a diplomatic passport. <laughs> and a diplomatic passport. We're going to take a quick break. Signed by Mulusi. <laughs> I saw something else signed by Mulusi yeah. down, downstairs. Yeah, the yeah. member of parliament thing. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we've done Blacksmith Mambazo twice. Yeah. Shall we do Soweto String Quartet again? No problem. No problem. You want something else? Something <laughs> Soweto String Quartet, then it is. You've been around Malawi enough to possibly give us an idea about what you think about what is happening in the country now. We are being led by the Tonse Alliance, which is a grouping of um, nine to ten political parties who have agreed to come together and run. Do you think it's a workable arrangement in the, in the first place? It should be. It should be. But I think it started wrong. Yeah. You see, what I've learned uh, in Malawi, that politicians you don't know how to make a coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, uh, European countries, not in Britain, but especially in Europe, they always have coalition government. No party ever gets a majority. But before they form a government, they sit down which parties can work together, and they discuss how they're going to handle education, how they handle uh, health, how to do agriculture, how do we promote business, they make a coalition agreement. And that they write down, it's a big book, and they publish it so that everybody in the country knows what they agreed. Now, if one of those parties sees that the others don't play ball, they say, Sally, this is what we agreed, I'm pulling out. And everybody knows that that's they what knows. they agreed. And they can say, look, they are not doing it. And when they go in the next election, say, this is what we would have done. Right? Mm -hmm. Now comes Tons Alliance. Chilima goes in it, no conditions. There is no agreement. We don't know what they talked. It's not public. So now we can say, look, uh, MCP, you're not doing what we have agreed to do, but we don't know that. We don't know. Now, if he had pulled out now, he can't say, yes, but this is what we agreed. Because we didn't know in the first place. We didn't know. So that's, that's wrong. Before you go into a coalition, you first sit down and agree. Mm -hmm. Now, in his case, he had few MPs, so he didn't that much leverage. But yes. For example, in the government when Atopele joined Mutarika, he had 15% of the votes. He would have demanded five or six ministers minimum. On oh, no, Mutarika, you don't want it? Fine, I'm out. He goes in parliament as a majority government, mm -hmm. and Mutarika would have learned very quickly what it means to have a minority government, because the opposition parties could have created one law after the other. Yes. And he couldn't refuse. Yeah. That's how powerful a minority party can be in a coalition. Mm -hmm. But they don't play that game here. So in the next comes it's going to be the same story. Someone will work together with another one. I hear stories already that that's happening. Mm -hmm. But... It is what it is. So in, in effect, that small coalition party can be extremely powerful mm -hmm. if you play the game properly. That's how I see it. So what keeps you busy now? What are, what are you doing? I'm retiring now. You're not retired. You're running I'm up and down. Um... No, I'm going to stop now. I'm 77. <laughs> I will do some small jobs as a hobby, but I don't take the big jobs anymore. Okay. And besides, the problem is because government is broke. I haven't been paid for six years, and I'm broke too. <laughs> the government owes me money for six years. <laughs> six years, that's a hell of a long time. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people complain that uh, if you want to work with government, then you, you, sh you should be ready to, 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 close, to close shop and go home because well, it takes you, them it forever. It used to be okay, but since, since the last seven, eight years, it is yeah. terrible. Yes. I, uh, I sent my invoice in uh, March 16 and it hasn't been paid. There's a lot of money. Yes, a lot and of money. right now, through the lawyers, we've gone to court. 
Mm. That government doesn't have the money. Uh. So I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe government is broke and they government can't is, pay. I'm sure government is broke. They inherited a huge debt and tried to pay it off, but that's not so easy. I understand that the Mbayani maternity wing was was also inspired by, by you. You, you yeah, had to, I did that. Yeah. yeah. That, that, those, those are the days that you were still active in, in politics? It was before that. It was actually before that? That was when we did the development committee. Yes. And uh, I, I organized money from Europe mm -hmm. and uh, built that. So it's a health center, maternity and OPD. Yes, yes. Do you ever think of getting back into politics? No. But I've done my job. You've <laughs> done enough. But maybe serve as an advisor or something like that? Because I think you still have the, the Look, political uh, wits around you. I am not going to, to apply for anything or try anything. If someone wants me, then I'm, I can I'm, talk I'm, your, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking like your manager now. I'm, I'm <laughs> advertising. I'm, I'm marketing you. No, not really. <laughs> Look, we have sort of it. If, you, know, you know, if someone just uh, wants me as, as in government, yeah. I might consider it, but I don't think they want it. But you did indicate that you have met the current president, Dr. Lazarus Chakwera, yes, before. Yeah. To discuss issues of national development? Or? Yes, and I wanted to know where he stands and what, he, what sort of man it is. I mean, at the end, you vote. And for whom do you vote? Mm -hmm. So I, I had an audience with him. It was quite interesting. Do, do, you, do you ever get a feeling that maybe your ideas are not, um, are not appreciated or, or implemented at some point? To a point where you feel, well, well it doesn't serve any more purpose to share them with anybody at all. Well, I've given up on that. I wrote many ideas on many uh, different issues. Mm -hmm. uh, like on, uh, for example, on education. I think our education system is wrong. Mm. And uh, you see, you are in primary school eight years. Yes. No country has got eight years primary school. Six is the normal norm in the world. So why do we do eight years? If we reduce it to six years, you get um, the same number of teachers, so less pupils per teacher, you will improve education. Okay. Now, after six years, what are you going to do? You select the children, but they can only go to secondary school. There is no other choice. Where okay. can they go? Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't happen in any other country. Other countries, they have a, a lower secondary school, a middle secondary school, and a higher secondary school. The lower ones go to a simple school, where they at least learn basic skills. Mm -hmm. The better ones go to the middle one. The very good ones go to the high one, which is go up to university later on. Ah. But if the lower ones go do well, Maybe they will shift to the middle school. It can be considered. They can play around with that, yeah. you see. Now, also in, in all, all countries in the world, they have technical schools who start straight after primary. Okay. When have we, we now have TEVIN, but they still design, they, they want JCE for it or something like that. That's crazy. Well, there is hundreds and thousands of children who have got skilled hands, who can do something with their hands. But after primary school, they're nowhere. They can't go anywhere. Where are they going? They if you have... don't pass mm -hmm. your exams, mm -hmm. where are you going? You're stuck. You're stuck. You have Joseph Primary School. End of story. Wow. Now they tried vocational training in the village. That's a good start, but there isn't enough possibilities. I would reduce primary school to six and create more possibilities after that. Uh -huh. Now the other problem is, I think there's about 300,000 children coming from secondary school every year. Uh -huh. And we're creating maybe 30,000 jobs in this country every year. What are they going so you to do? So you've got almost 270 uh, learners. People will fall in between. Mm -hmm. That's why I get my garden boy here making 50,000 quarts of his secondary school education. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. what, what can he do? You can't invest so much time in your education and still end up earning that little salary. Look, Chilima said I'm going to create one million jobs. I, I asked, how? in one year. <laughs> you don't see it, but that would be great if you could manage that. Nobody can, because um, I mean, that's where now we start getting to define what a job is after we've already made a yeah, promise. That's it. That's the problem. But to create a job, agriculture, but industry, industry, industry. Do something. Make something. That's what we need to do. Look, we can do more horticulture, try to export it to Europe and flowers and things like that. Uh. 
it's not going to make Malawi wealthy. You need to do more. I don't think there's any country in the world who is wealthy based on agriculture alone. Uh -huh. It's a dual thing. You see, for example, if you get industry that will maybe be in towns or in urban centers, right? That attracts laborers. They suck it out of the agricultural sector, those laborers, but they start making money. But they need to eat. So they buy it from the farmers. Now the farmer starts making money locally because he has to feed those urban centers. But here, Everybody grows his own bloody food, even people who are rich <laughs> grow their own food. <laughs> so what money can this farmer make? Yeah. That farm is supposed to feed the urban centers. Yes, yes, yes. But 15% of people live in urban centers and that's all. So they don't make money on that. If you industrialize, you create a labor force who is depending on this agriculture sector, so you stimulate the agriculture sector indirectly. I could go on and on talking to our guests today, but time is up. And we have to go. <laughs> I've got a set of questions which I'd like to ask you, to which you can only answer yes or no. But first you have to tell me your full name. What is your full name? My full name is Jan Jaap Jacobus Sonke. Do you have any tattoos? No. <laughs> I don't do that. Do you have any piercings? No. Do you have children? Yes. Have you ever shot a gun? No. Have you cried over someone? Yes. Have you fallen in love before? Oh, yes. Have you killed a chicken before? Have you ever gotten into a fight? With my ex, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what my problem is? No. I'm married to Tokuzani here. Yes. And it is boring. Because <laughs> you don't get to fight? I'm missing the fight. <laughs> <laughs> he loves the fight. And somebody took the sting out of his fight. Um, have you gotten any surgeries? Yes. Have you ever been hospitalized? Yes. Have you donated blood? Yes. Have you ever smoked weed? No. Would you smoke weed? No. Have you ever drunk alcohol? Sometimes if people force me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still drink alcohol? Well, sometimes when you go the to same a party come and, and force you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> have you broken someone's heart? Yes. Have you had a crush on someone? A crush? A crush. Toko, did I have <laughs> a crush on someone? <laughs> 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 so you, you keep talking about uh, <laughs> he doesn't have a crush on anyone you're married to Toko now yes. and you said you have children how many children do you have four where are they are they are they in Malawi or they one or... is here okay. two are coming here desperately and my son is in Manchester but okay. he, he left Malawi only for one reason yes he works on the internet uh -huh. and the internet is 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 slow. So he is an artist. He makes art on the internet and lives on that. I see. So he needs fast internet. Okay. That was his problem. Uh, but he would love to come. I All know. my children actually. Absolutely. My eldest daughter is probably coming the end of this month. Yes. To settle down here. Mm -hmm. And my second daughter wants to set up an art and uh, music school, mm -hmm. trying to get money for that. Mm -hmm. She will settle in Lilongwe. Mm -hmm. My youngest daughter is here doing graphic advertising and things like that. If you see these big billboards of cable manufacturers, that yes. is her designs. Brilliant. Mm. We're going to wind up with you. Just take me on a very, very quick tour of your house. A few things that I'd like you to show me around. How many rooms does this house have? Uh, three bedrooms, a living room and a small office and two bathrooms. And many pictures, of course. And a store. Yeah. And you were telling me about... Uh, like this picture, that is my pride. Ah, this, that's Nelson Mandela. That's Nelson Mandela. That's you right there, that's right? That's me. What, what was the meeting about? Well, it, that was greeting him at Chileka Airport. When he ah, came when he had come to Malawi. Yeah. And you were there to welcome him. That's right. That's when you were a minister? Yes. Okay. And here I was representing the uh, minister's fin finance meeting of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. I'm right here. Yes. And Gordon Brown is there. Wow, Gordon Brown. It was at the Cayman Islands. <laughs> yes. And um, and this, this is from... Uh, that is from New Guinea. That's a stone axe. Uh, axe. A real one. It's a real stone axe. Yeah. That's quite tough. Yeah. And this one too. This is a dagger of human bone, which they used. It's a, it's, it's a human bone? Yeah. They use it for what? Dagger. A dagger? To kill people. To kill people? Yeah. So they kill a human being and they can, they, they oh, can take oh, their bones so they can kill more people. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and these are arrows. Yes. This is a war arrow. It's poison. Oh, yeah. This is for birds. This is for fish. 
with different arrows. Oh, different kinds of arrows with uh, with with uh, different kinds of finishes at the end. Yeah. You see these little thorns, they put it on uh, on the side. Yes. And they poison that. Yeah. And when you pull it out of the wound, these arrow these these thorns break off and you, you don't survive. That's, that's really and vicious. the poison they used was from a cadaver. They oh. will kill the enemy. Yes. And they put him on a platform in the tree. And when he rots, put the arrows in his body. And that was the poison they used. They take the poison from the from, from well, a dead it is, body. It is bacteria. And because ah, they don't so know antibiotics, they can Yeah, die. so they, they so, so they mm. infect the other person yeah. with that. that and, and, and this uh, and this is yeah, uh, that is something that I inherited from my brother. It's just in the, I don't know where it came from. And you also said, but do you still play the violin? Because well, I, I, I try, I try. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other musical instrument that you play other than the no, violin? No, only the violin. Did you learn this in school or you just yes, uh, it's it's a, a skill a, that you acquired along the way? I did, yes. Uh -huh. ah. Would they hear it? Yes, <laughs> I'd love to hear you play the violin. <laughs> Whatever tune you can play. Okay. <laughs> That's Jan Yapzonke's rendition of the Malawi National Anthem, bringing us to the end of Cruise 5 today. <laughs>